Welcome back to part two of The Guilty Feminist. So plug in and get ready for the fun. In terms of this, the power of difference in our society, the power of who we resource, who we center, who we nourish, who se- who deserves to get the spoils, who deserves to get the stuff on the table. Um, there is a norm, you know, I was raised very much with a norm of what normal looked like. And the more normal you could be, the better things were. And when, certainly when I was growing up, people who were not of this norm, whatever that was in, uh, you know, whether that be whiteness or straightness or gender conformity or, you know, uh, n- uh, d- Christianity. disability, Christianity, you know, in my in my beach town, blondness, tannedness, you know, there was, so yeah. it, it goes, you know, into all of these details. That norm uh, was unquestioned when I was growing up. And you could be outside of it, but you knew you were outside of it and that was your decision or something you couldn't freaking help. But you knew not to expect more if you weren't going to be constantly changing yourself to be as normal as possible. Did you feel that growing up? Did you feel that call to the normal? Yeah, I talk about that a lot in my first book, Over the Top, about like this fear that I wasn't normal and like, you know, wanted to be normal. I think what I also talk about in Over the Top and what I explore further and love that story is that like normal is as unique as there are people in the world. So like normal is a figment of our imagination. Mm-hmm. Um you know, it's it's not a total made up thing because it's like obviously we observe like what people consider to be normal and what falls within and, you know, outside that boundary. But it is also something that's like kind of a construct, which is, you know, as is the gender binary, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I do want to kind of go back to one thing that you just said, though, that I think is interesting. In that first question that was like, you know, the first queer eye was here to say this and this queer eye is more here to say that. And one thing that I feel is like this this pressure of like having been on this queer eye and that I think and not saying that this is like you as an interviewer, it's like, it's just something that I observe. Like the queer community is so large as large. I mean, there's like, Mm. you know, if there's 7 billion people in the world, there's like probably, you know, like at least a billion of us or something that are on some of those spectrums, you know, there's just like a lot of people. And I just think that like to task a show like Queer Eye or any TV show with representing what it is to be like a full spectrum of queerness is just like a lot of pressure. And I also feel like it's not totally accurate because like there is so much to queer people outside of let me judge your house. Let me do your hair. Let me teach you how to cook. Let me teach you what culture means. Mm. Like there's just so much more to us as humans than that. It's just that like in 2003 and largely in 2018, those are the only categories where people are feel that it is acceptable for us to be is like humans. Like, okay, I'm comfortable with you if you're like going to talk about my hair or if you're going to talk about my, you know, interior design or my clothes. But the second that I want to talk to you about like the history of gender binary or if I want to talk to you about what it is to be HIV positive or if I want to talk about the HIV safety net or if I want to advocate for something politically or anything like that, it's like, stay in your lane. What do you know? I don't need your education. I don't. So I just think it's interesting that like, the observations are there is that like, I don't think that queer eye has ever been a representation of the queer community, nor should it be. It's really just a TV show about people connecting with people and, you know, people trying to help people. That's what I think that's what, what David Mm -hmm. Collins, the creator of the show would say, I can't speak for him, but I think it's really about connection and helping people. It's not what like tasking or us saying, this is what queer community is. Mm-hmm. Or the first one was asking for tolerance and this isn't for I just think those, it makes it like too big. And mm-hmm. we're just doing our best as people to tell stories and connect with people. So that's that. Then the other thing that I see is that like, there also like hasn't been as much progress as I want there to be in terms of like, well, then we were asking for this, but now we're asking for this. One thing that I talk about and love that story is that like, right after the Queer Eye episode where we got to go to my hometown and do, you know, Kathy Dooley's makeover, who's like someone that I love so much. I think she's incredible. There was like a literal brutal hate crime right after we left where like a young person was attacked. 
couldn't report it to the police because like wasn't safe to report it to the police in the city that like voted for Trump to to one mm-hmm. and in a city where like if this person would have reported their attacker is like it wouldn't have been safe at school it wouldn't like they were this person was planning on staying local for college so like it would have made their life 50,000 times harder to report the assault that happened to them so has representation on TV gotten better yes but for the queer people that are in rural communities and even urban communities across the United States and the world for that matter, violence against queer people is actually rising. It's been rising steadily since 2017. Every single year it's gotten worse. The, there is no correlation between representation on TV and legislative victories or safety for queer people. And I think that that's a really important thing to mention too, because mm-hmm. too often we look at shows like Queer Eye and we're like, oh my God, look at the progress we've made. No. Tell that to the kid who got their ass kicked and can't go to school. Tell that to the kids whose family have disowned them and cannot get education. Tell that to the kid who, like, experiences employment discrimination on a daily basis in rural cities and urban communities across the globe. So I just think it's important that we don't conflate representation with, like, legislation or, like, lifestyle improvement for, like, the queer community Mm -hmm. at large. Yeah, I absolutely hear that. And thank you for saying it. Your passion is justified. And I absolutely hear that. That is a shocking statistic that violence against queer people is rising. Do you have any ideas as to why that might be? Well, I think that the political climate doesn't help. I think that like in both the United Kingdom and the United States, there's a concerted effort to scapegoat trans people, uh, to vilify trans people. We're talking about um trans people's ability to seek health care we're felonizing trans people's ability to seek health care we are restricting trans people's access to sport um and trans people are not the reason that say health care in the United Kingdom has been divested from year after year after year after year by your government Trans people are not the reason why our infrastructure is crumbling and we don't invest in our roads here in the United States. It's not trans people's fault or the reason why opioid deaths are at their highest they've ever been. Uh, Pharmaceutical costs, healthcare, infrastructure, violence against women, firearms. These are all things that are huge issues that are killing people on an everyday basis. Yet people like Fox News... uh, And yet, you know, like what Boris Johnson is doing right now by like not including like convert or trans people in conversion therapy and saying that we see this as an attack on humanity. That is dominating airwaves instead of the things that are like really like we're scapegoating trans people. And Mm -hmm. it's so clear that that's what's happening. And it's been a recurring theme for hundreds of years, actually. It's what my podcast that just came out today is about, about the history of female husbands which is really interesting because like a lot of this like transphobic vitriol has like literally been around since the 16 and 1700s. So I think that it's a, we're in a precarious state because we have leaders who are scapegoating the queer community at large. Um, And that's just been, and I think that that's a, it's a reaction to marriage equality. I think that there is, there's been a conservative backlash because it's like, if you look at how things have been like, you know, how that pendulum of public opinion has fluctuated between, you know, conservatism and being progressive. Usually there's like an equal and opposite reaction through history. When things get progressive, Mm -hmm. it swings that other way. And I think that we're swinging in that other direction right now. And I think that how can we educate and, speak to what's going on right now because we've seen time and time again that when we scapegoat groups of people nothing good happens there's a series Mm -hmm. of things that happen or that can happen but they're never good yes and the pattern is clear again and again and again and again when you take especially a marginalized group and say those people are the enemy those people might hurt me if we let them in the bathroom or the fitting room or i don't want to be at the same water fountain as this person it always ends the same way when will we learn i mean our listeners are very active and if this was a live show the heckle we would be getting now is what can we do i see your passion and i feel it i see your anger at the way that your community I'm, I'm bisexual so our community is is treated although obviously I'm very you know 
I'm a very privileged queer person. It's not. But I'm obsessed. Know. Yes. Yeah. Hello, I, I, fam. I love that about you. <laughs> um, and uh, and it's it's something I've only. I'm doing a stand up show about it now. It's just something I've I've started to explore in the last. Uh, two years, I, I've had to open my marriage to explore it. Um, I sensed I was bisexual and I was like, I don't want this side of myself shut down, you know, like I need to explore. And it's been incredible. But I think what the Guilty Feminist listeners will want to know is what can we do to fight this? Because there is a war on trans people at the moment in Britain that I think is, it, I mean, it's embarrassing. The UK is the worst in the world, I feel, for it. I don't know about how it compares to America, but I feel in Europe so I, I would say that, like, we're kind of winning right now, depending on your state. I mean, just because we're, like, making it a felony, like, we're literally, like, there are states that are making it a felony for parents to seek gender-affirming health care right. for their child, even if that's, like, hormone blockers or, like, it's not taking, mm-hmm. it's not, like, we're not talking about, like, transitioning your child medically. We're talking about, like, puberty blockers to like stave off puberty long enough for that kid to figure out who they are and what they want to do. Puberty blockers are also reversible and also endorsed by like every major medical academy and network and organization, like on the face of the planet. Um, Well, at least like Western like planets. I bet like the pediatric Academy of like, you know, like Saudi Arabia probably wouldn't, but mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. The point is, and, and maybe they do, who knows? I don't know, mm-hmm. can't tell you. Um, Cause actually they are widely, uh, well, I'll tell you this much. They probably are okay there as long as it's for cis kids. Cause it's like if a little girl's experiencing precocious puberty, they will put her on hormone blockers. Uh. Like that happens all the time in straight children. It also happens in athletes for like performance enhancing drugs. Like a lot of times in like gymnastics, figure skating, they will put those kids on puberty blockers if puberty is going to like throw off their athletic ability. Right. So it right, happens right. a lot of times in cis in cisgender. Yeah, if you're kids. Judy Garland, they'll put you on them. But if you if you are, uh, but if you're experiencing gender, gender dysphoria, yeah. no, it's not. It's, it's yeah. It's like it's if you're if you have gender dysphoria, gender dysphoria and you're trans, yeah. like yeah. deal with it. And like mm-hmm. you know, and we're gonna throw your family in jail and your doctor, and he's gonna there he she or they are gonna be a felon now. Um, that's what's happening in a lot of states. In Texas, we had the governor of Texas um, and the attorney general issue a letter to the Department of Child and Family Services urging them to investigate any person, any kid in their family who is trans or gender nonconforming for child abuse and that they were needing to be reported by their teachers or family members. Like they set up a hotline to like report families of gender nonconforming kids like to investigate them for child abuse and it was going on for months at a time in the state before it was shut down and even now i think some people are still being investigated and similar laws have been passed in other states so it's really it's really bad but what people can do right now what people can do right now is make sure that they are educating themselves make sure that when they see news articles about it they aren't like flipping through it and being like oh this makes me feel bad and i'm powerless so i don't want to do- talk about it i think we're trained we're trained to not talk about religion and politics with our families because we don't want to like ruffle feathers and, you know, you just want to connect with your, and actually that's one of my entire essays in here is called, sorry, Karen, white privilege and white fragility looks really bad on you. And part of that privilege is not talking about trans issues because you think they don't affect you. So you let it happen. And what my friend Alok is doing such brilliant work of and what they've taught me to do too, is that we need to make cisgender people understand the ways in which the violence of these transphobic laws impacts them too. Because these laws that say like, you're not woman enough to play sports, you're not man enough to play sports. And also these laws that are like, you know, bathroom bills. It's like, we're talking about kids' genitals. Like you're talking about like, do you want to give the government the ability to come check what's between your legs? Do we want to let the government have the ability to say, you don't look the way we think you should look. And for that reason, we are going to investigate you. First, it's trans people. Then it's women don't look enough like this. Then it's men. You know what I'm saying? It's like, this is an assault on everyone. It's not just a trans issue. It's a, it's an everybody issue. And actually, when it comes to sports, you look at, because um, there is no uniform hormone range for men or women. It's like a figment. That's like another made up thing. Like there isn't a set hormonal range that like says like, this is what men are and this is what women are. And because of that, there's women and people who are intersex who have been assigned female at birth and have lived their entire lives as women 
And then because there's no like hormone, like designated like range, but then we have these arbitrary ones by the IOC. It's like people like Castro Semenya who are Olympic gold medalists, like can't run anymore. It's like, cause often women from the global South can have higher levels of testosterone in their bodies than what they've had in Europe and Western culture. And why is that? It's because all of the hormonal levels that, that the IOC and the U S and Europe go off of that dictates, you know, this is what women fall between. And this is what men fall between. I'm holding up air quotes just so you guys know was literally like based off of white people in like the forties, fifties, sixties, seventies. So mm-hmm. it's like the, like there wasn't even like a full account of all of humans to even make up these levels. And if there would have been, you would find that men and women interchangeably fall all up over those levels of estrogen and testosterone. And, and also, in your by the life, way, you, you morph. In your life, you morph. Cisgender women often get more testosterone as they get older. Um, oh, I, oh, yes. And, but the point was, too, it's like, what can we do? It's like, make sure you're educated. Your vote is a huge issue, like voting in midterms, voting in every single election, understanding how your vote and understanding like what your vote impacts for trans people's lives. So understand where your elected officials uh, stances are on trans issues. That's a big thing you can do. And then the other thing that you can do is take these conversations into uncomfortable spaces in your life and your friends and family. If you can go have conversations about like why trans people should be able to play sports, if you can talk about why trans people should be able to use the bathroom and the gender that they are, if you can go talk about that with like every JK Rowling in your life, people who like would not take it to heart, people who would like push back and become really angry. If you can stay calm and educate yourself and have conversations with people who disagree and help people understand how they are being bigoted and how they are causing destruction, harm, death, disease on people by espousing these turf ideologies. That's what we need you to do. We need you to get uncomfortable. We need you to be willing to be uncomfortable for marginalized people. That means talking to people that may push back. That might mean setting boundaries with people in your life that are espousing problematic views. It's uncomfortable. It's a process. And it's something you have to like keep doing. That's what we need people to do to be allies. Do you think JK Rowling would sit down with you because of your profile and also your warmth and charm and positivity? Do you think that she would sit down with you and have this conversation? Maybe. I feel like I would need like my CEO coach and my friend Alok. Uh, I would really like for my friend Alok to be there because they're much better with dealing with um, like problematic people. They have like a lot more compassion and love. I'm also just like, so, and I have, I have a, it's, I'm so disappointed. Like I've looked up to JK Rowling for so long and I've like been such a fan of her work for like my entire like adolescence. And Harry Potter was like this world that I was like able to escape in when I was being, tortured and bullied and never knew like a way out. And she created like an escape for me for so long. And so to see her be like this and kind of like, you know, welcome violence and harm against trans people in the name of like protecting, like air quote, protecting women, which is also like trans and non-binary people advocating for our safety and our right to be human does not take away from women and their safety and their right to be human. Like both of those things can be true at once. Cause really like we're coming from this place of like abundance that there is enough room at the table for everyone there. Like this idea that like, like why are we fighting over crumbs? Like we're fighting over crumbs when like really the patriarchy is taking the cake. And so I just feel like we need to turn our attention to the systems that are actually oppressing people and it's the patriarchy and the gender binary in the first place that's oppressing people not trans and non-binary folks gang i'm very excited to tell you that at the end of this year we're coming up to seven years old That's right, we are having an enormous, great big monumental, guilty feminist party and show at the Hammersmith Apollo. Yeah, like we're live at the Apollo is, but it's all guilty feminist comedians, acts, and exciting guests. I can't even tell you about yet. Um, Now, 
It's going to be on the 1st of October on a Saturday night. Come one, come all. Uh, so get your WhatsApp groups together. Get tickets now before they all go uh, because it's going to be a one-night festival of feminism fun and refuel for the resistance. If you like Michael McIntyre's Roadshow, if you like Graham Norton, if you like Jules Holland's Later, imagine those three men were women. And then imagine those women were allowed on the television. And then imagine they were allowed to invite other women to join them. And you would have an idea of how incredible this show is going to be. We are going to have some pop sensations. We are going to have some comics you know and love from The Guilty Feminist and the telly and some guests we've never, ever had on before. So please book now. We will be releasing more information soon. If you'd like to get a ticket now, go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on live shows. It's our birthday. You absolutely don't have to bring a present, but I'm not stopping you. Is it you that should be having the conversation with JK Rowling or is it an ally because it's easier for an ally to talk about it dispassionately? That too. Because I wonder, I, I wonder about it. This is the illustration I use that, I don't know, it might be, uh, I don't know, I just want to share, I just feel I want to share it with you. Um, I'm adopted and I've had a lot of a success talking to people who just couldn't get it. We're like, but biology, but biology. And this is what I say to them is, um, biologically, I am not my mother's daughter, but I am my mother's daughter. And it is far more true to say that I am my mother's daughter than it is to not. Um, but if she needs a kidney, I cannot help her because in that one way, I am not my, but I am my mother's daughter. And if people- And what if you guys have the same blood type or something? Maybe your kidney would work. You don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe. But I suspect, you know, like there is a way in which I'm not, but I don't want people on Twitter going, you're stepping on the truth of real mothers and daughters. She's your guardian. You're her ward. Let ha We have to be honest about this. That would be so hurtful to me that I could not talk to those people. But here's the thing, and this is what I'm writing about in my book. I'm writing a book called Six Conversations We're Scared to Have, um, that it's very new, this idea that you adopt a baby and you say, I'm your mom and you're my baby. If you read like you know any books like Anne of Green Gables, you're a ward. They're the guardian. And if my both my sister and brother are biologically my parents, so would, if I'd been raised with this is my daughter, this is my son, and this is our ward, we don't. She's not really one of us. The psychological damage that would have been done to me. So society kindly said, we're going to use the language that's going to make you feel included and a hundred percent your mother's daughter. And now, so therefore, it is true that I am my mother's daughter, and everybody thinks I am. And so many people have said to me, oh, I would never say you want your mother's daughter. And I'm like, but biology. And they're like, but I wouldn't, no, but you are. And I'm like, uh-huh, but biology. And they're like, but no. And I said, if you saw people online saying you're not really your mother's daughter, you're just, you're an orphan, how would you feel? Would you, even though everything, even though everything that my mother raised me and I call her mother and, you know, and they are like, I would tell them that's really cruel. And I'm like, uh-huh, so trans women. And they're like, okay, I get it. And I think sometimes because I'm an ally, I am not the other in their eyes. And so I can have that conversation. And right. I really feel, but I will never say to them, I would never use the word turf to them. I would never say the word bigoted to them because I think that's going to make them go, you know, like, oh, I'm on, I'm in the other team and I'm always trying to get round. But I think too many allies online are like out there, like being right and kind of beating people up. And I'm like, it's not helping. If you're going to go in with all guns blazing to show how right you are as an ally, as an adopted child, I would not have the emotional fortitude to be like, let me explain it to you. But as a cisgendered woman, I have got the emotional fortitude to say, let me explain it to you. And I really want allies to start thinking about how they speak about these things, to come in with an argument that helps somebody else open their eyes and go, oh, do you know what I mean by this? The same way we mm -hmm. as white people like need to be not just going, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. You know, when uh, in that summer of when Black Lives Matter came to the boil, I saw a lot of white people who had only learned this stuff two years ago really screaming at other white people. I'm like, hey, you had to learn this. Go in to teach and to get on side. If you meet a race, to me, if I meet a racist person, it's my job to leave them at least no more racist than when I found them. You know what I'm saying? Don't make it worse. Like, you know, that's not your job as an ally. So I feel like maybe it's the job of somebody who understands it, who can get I to JK Rowling. I'm 100% with you. I'm 100% with you. 
Um, I'm hundred percent with you on that. Yeah, you you do it. You do it. You do you do the chat. I, I don't go and do talk to Joe. I go and talk to yeah, Jake. I'll have a breakdown, honey. And then it's like, and then they can just be like, see, you are like they see they get like because the, then it just it like only like makes them feel like they prove their point. Like when like if you lose it, which is why I was like a low cast to come because a is like such a genius at like not losing it, like just so compassionate and so loving. Mm. Whereas like I turn into Aaron Brockovich. <laughs> Like, <laughs> like I just want, like I just want to, but like not as clever. Like the uh, writers in that room, clever. yeah. The writers in that room. Has there ever been a movie since that had like better verbal takedowns than Aaron Brockovich? I don't think so. There has not. I'm, so, I'm really excited. She's uh, Julia Roberts is playing uh, the woman who instigated Watergate, which I've, we've never even heard of her. We've never even heard of her, and I'm very excited about that. It's a new show called Gaslit. But her hair, Julia Roberts' hair, and to get back to hair in every single show and every single film, always different, always on point. Always oh, so good. She has the she has some good hair. You're so right about that. Some good hair, right? And I mean, Pretty Woman. My God. Ugh. You know what? Your intelligence and understanding of these issues and your passion for them, I don't think I understood how much of an activist you were. I understand now talking to you the reason why you're so successful because it is not coming from a place of let me be famous and do this and do this and this, but it's coming from a place of let me be here and let me be seen and let me connect. And I I feel like this new age of... I guess social media with all its horrors and, you know, streaming 24-hour everything, a little bit of everything all of the time, is allowing voices to come forward to be seen and to say, we demand more and we demand better. We demand extra. If I could give you a magic wand and you could change just like, you know, two or three things about this world, what would you change? If I just said JVN runs the world for a couple of days, what would you change? Remove the existence of the gender binary. Cure all viruses. Excellent. Well done. Good. That's a brilliant genie move. Can I do cure all viruses slash cancer so that I don't have to take up my third? Yes, absolutely. Thing? Absolutely. Yeah, so that it would be that. I'd be like that and then that yeah it's like no more because in my mind if we remove the gender binary we also cure transphobia and homophobia yes one foul swoop yeah with that you're done um you know because then it's like people can't it's like you know i can't i don't know i can't be pissed I'm not mad anymore it's like i'm just not mad it's a, and then you know then and we're not sick you know because there's yeah. no viruses or cancer anymore maybe we could do a cold or something you know maybe you get a little bacterial infection but you know, nothing that you die from, you know, so it's like, uh-huh. you know, we, like we're only dying from like old age. Then, and like old age would be like 186, like really old. And then the third thing I would do, ooh, then I would invent, or like there would need to be like this really fucking fierce ass, nice lab grown leather and meat. Oh. So that you could have like a great alligator bag, a great fucking burger, but like no cute cow and no probably rude alligator who would like eat my cats, which is why I don't feel bad if I have one. You know what I'm saying? Like yes. an alligator bag. But I, I, mean, I still do feel a little bad just, you know, like with the whole like, you know, lack of sustainability and like that poor fucking crocodile. Because like, you know, you probably you were going to eat my cat because the cat wasn't even there. You know what I'm saying? Right. So like lab grown meats and purses yeah i i feel like that that part would i would add to the sustainability of the earth so dramatically if we could if and we could do it the thing is if elon musk would turn instead of buying twitter would have put money into stuff like that if the billionaires if that we've we've allowed the world to get to a point where there are a half a dozen billionaires and then they just decide what they want to buy and i'm like oh my god if we could buy committee go there's x billion what could we do that could be done that could okay, actually be done okay not to like talk about a lightning rod issue on the johnny depp case like on the guilty feminist but let me go just say it. this i'm not here to comment on anything about it cuz i think it's there's so much about it that it's just like oh my god comment away and have I been a little bit glued to, have I been watching, have I seen, yes. Okay, I have seen the trial. Okay, it's like, I, I don't know what <laughs> my problem is. This is such an I'm a feminist butt moment here. Okay, go on. Um, okay. And again, like, like, just, I know that I'm shallow and vapid for saying this. So just know that ahead of time. I cannot 
get over the interior design choices <laughs> of I cannot. And I also feel like that must go to show like his state of mind. Cause like that fucking yacht. How do you have a yacht? What I kept thinking when I look at these pictures, I'm like, you have like Kardashian, Mary Kate and Ashley level money. Like he has like, he has him some like Musk adjacent oh, yeah. money. Where is your Kardashian ass interior designer? Where is like the conc- concrete polished walls? Where is your organized cupboard? Why does it look like you asked the set designer of Pirates of the Caribbean to be like, are you going to use this like angry pirate den set? Or can I just take this with me? Like the red velvet couches, the shag carpet, like the, I'm like, where is your rich person? Like, like if I was that rich and that was how I decorated. Actually, I think what I meant to say was is that for no other reason, Amber deserves to win. I rule for the defendant because oh. she had to deal with like, they, look at his house. <laughs> I can't, it's the, it is the fugliest, fu- like, and then my, I was talking about this French gymnastics coach and she said, she said, you know what? She said, you cannot buy style. And I've never heard mm. a more true sentence. And, you know what I'm saying? You can't, like, if you just have bad fucking taste, yeah. you just have like bad taste mm. and say what you will about Kim K. Mm-hmm. But that taste, that interior design, the, the, the pantry, the, you know, everyone was coming for her for that like weird sink. I think it's fierce that 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 sink. Yeah, the minimalism. I'm here for it, and I'm not ashamed to say it. I think what I've heard there, JVN, is uh, you want to queer eye Johnny Depp. You just are desperate to go in and to you know, like, like no, not after these trials. You know, no, maybe not fifteen not, years ago. Not for him. Not for him. But when you see, when you're looking past into what's going on in there. You are like, can we please just fix this shit? Because there's just so much going on. And had you, had you. I don't need, he doesn't deserve for it to be fixed. What I'm saying is, is how does someone <laughs> who has that much resources <laughs> do, make, do it? Do it. Make so do many that. poor choices. Yeah. He does not deserve my fixing or my time, nor am I going to, because after this trial, honey, he's robbed enough. He's taken enough <laughs> of my life. But, but I just can't believe that it got that, that out of hand. Yes. Okay, when you're real, he was famous super young and you can get famous too young. And I think uh, you, everyone says yes to you. You've been spoiled for so long. Nobody says no to you. You lose touch with reality and you lose touch with, uh, you know, no one's going to come in Deborah, and tell did you, you see the pictures of this yacht? Did you see those pictures? I actually pictures? am going to look at them now just while we're online. Because it's been I in my, to- it's been in my head for like three days, two days now, like rent free, uh, like every two okay. hours. You just can't I, stop thinking. No, okay. it's, the, it's like these like red velvet couches. Okay. Uh, the look. pillows. It's. Okay. And I feel I'm like there's look. like Cheez-Its and Coke. It's, oh, there's just like Cheez-Its. Oh, oh, oh my God. Oh my God. It's it like is... I feel like there's just like Cheez-Its and like petrified Twinkies and like cocaine. You. Like you just oh like what's in God. that couch. Oh my God. That is actually terrifying. And it's so gothic. And that was his yacht. <laughs> It's a gothic yacht. It's like he thinks he's Captain Jack Sparrow. Yes. Okay, yeah, that's concerning and that does speak to state of mind. I fear he has morphed into his characters. Yeah, it's it's quite terrifying. It's a quite terrifying gothic imagery. Oh, dear. Yeah. It just, yeah. It. I think he got famous too young. Startlingly fugly furniture. Yeah, but no like, one goes onto his yacht and goes, Johnny, what are you doing? Because everyone wants to be his friend. So I think I would have, but I would have never yeah. found myself there. But I'm just saying. I think you would have and you would not have been invited back onto that yacht. Like in the pre-times when Johnny I don't Depp know. was cool. I feel like I could have probably talked my way back on. Like it would have been like, honey, oh. what is going on with this yacht? And then I think they would have thought it was cute. That is actually true. And then you would have ended up redesigning his yacht. You would have come back. And then and- we probably would have had a three-way. And then I would have been like, I'm so traumatized. I just want to go home. <laughs> like this was too much. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. Like, I just, you know, I freaked out. I feel like what's going to be picked up from this story is that uh, by the Daily Mail is Jonathan Van Ness had a three-way with uh, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. That's what they're going to say. In 2016, I wasn't, I was in a one-bedroom part apartment in Culver City, California. I didn't. Listen, I still never had the fortune of meeting either. You could have. You could have been. You could have been their bit of rough in those days. You know. That's I, all I'm saying. That's all yeah. I'm saying. 
They could have been like, we love this person with the one bedroom. I feel like Johnny Depp could have convinced me to have a three-way. Like it, like Amber, I would have been like, oh my God, can I like French braid your hair? But until like two years ago, I probably put pro- like, yeah, but he really just like, these back, last few years, and he, he just. Yeah, back in the day, obviously, and we all Edward would've... Scissorhands, that Johnny. Uh, at 21 Jump Street. Oh, who wouldn't have good. who wouldn't have jumped the Johnny of Twenty One Jump Street? You know, do you know who who yeah, wouldn't have who just, wouldn't have jumped the Johnny Depp from then? I loved his like kooky goth phase, like in the nineties. Yeah, there's been some very cute Johnny Depp eras, but it is so like now you just couldn't because of everything you know. Like now, devastating. JVN, I just want to tell you one more thing, and this is just something I want to share with you. I, have you ever done ayahuasca? Peruvian. No, but I've heard about it. Okay, I had the most incredible time. I went up a mountain in Spain. I'll tell you about another time over a cocktail about everything that happened to me. But this one thing happened where I was um, feeling my, uh, I was lying on a mattress. It's totally dark with 15 people in a room. um, uh, And I was feeling my stomach and it was, this bit was about my body. And uh, Mother Ayahuasca was talking to me. She's like a woman talks to you in this psychedelic haze. And she said, a woman's, because I was, you know, it was about the parts of my body. I'm like, you know, don't feel great about like my thighs. She said, if you hate this, when I was feeling my thighs, she said, if you hate this, you hate me because I'm the earth and you're from me. All very beautiful stuff. And then I was feeling my stomach and she said, my belly. And she said, a woman's belly has to be rounder than a man's because for in it, she contains the whole world. And I, right. And I said, mother ayahuasca, are you being trans exclusionary? Uh, and she said, no, it's a metaphor. Like she was annoyed. Like she was like, it's a metaphor. And I said, because I was just testing it. I wasn't being curious. Like I knew what was right. But I was like, Mother Earth, are trans women women? And she said, yes. She said, trans people are the most sacred people on earth because for within them, they contain both the tobacco and the ayahuasca, the masculine and the feminine. And I said, that's lovely, but I feel like you're dodging the question a bit. Are trans women women? And she said, yes. She said, everyone knows who they are. And if you will just listen, they will tell you. And when I came out of it the next day, and this was like a part of a very long whole trip, I talked to the shaman and he's he doesn't speak English, so he speaks to an interpreter. It makes him feel very, very mysterious. And he was just so warm and beautiful and everything he said. And he was telling me all about these things. And I told him this section and I said, is there anything in the Peruvian culture about trans people or gender non-conforming people? And he looked kind of annoyed and like every other time so beautiful, calm. And he said through the translator, he said, Deborah, ayahuasca is a divine medicine. If Mother Earth has told you something, you do not check with a man to see if it is so. And I was like, oh, my God, Mother Earth's given me a message and I've, I've asked a man. Anyway, then I looked it up. According to the Antian Cosmovision, this is who the people who invented ayahuasca by putting these two plants together, the most sacred shaman were third gender. They were trans of all of them. The most sacred people in the world. And they were shamans and they were so sacred. And then the conquistadors came and brought Christianity and obviously – also, listen to the lovely third gender shamans. No, that's right. They killed them. Um, and came and brought their violence and then also brought Christianity. And then that was and the And their end. nasty diseases. Yes. So in the Andean Cosmovision, where this sort of, I think it's so sacred. Like I was very like um, atheist. I was used to be a Jehovah's Witness. So I was so atheist and yada, yada, yada up until a couple of months ago. And now I'm like, it's not like I believe God is in the sky or anything, but the the earth, my relationship to the earth, since I've done some psychedelics, is extraordinary. But didn't you just say that you started exploring your sexuality a few months ago too? To, to, I, to a couple of years ago. When was I? Jan- January 2020. Okay, but for the purposes of my joke, it was more like, oh my God, like after you... Oh, indulge in the vagina yeah, yeah, for the first yeah, time. You yeah, were like, yeah. there is a God. And I was like, honey, you're bisexual as fuck, honey. Like you needed, the, you like, you met vagina and you were like, honey, it's, there is a God. Well, I will say it's all part of the same exploration. The last two years, um, just before the pandemic to now, I've explored so much and my bisexuality and also my relationship to Mother Earth, very similar. It's all on the same spectrum. But I just wanted to share that with you because Mother Earth told me trans people are the most sacred people on Earth. And I love that. They contain within them both tobacco and ayahuasca, and everyone knows who they are. 
And if you listen, that'll tell you. And I was like, this is the most beautiful thing that Mother Earth just said to me. So I just wanted Thanks, to- Mother Earth. I, th- I, wanted to sh- I wanted to share it with you. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. And I hope I get to see you again if you're in London and you ever want a cocktail or anything. And if you're No, we have to because also I just have to tell you that there's this other woman in my life who I love so much. I'm also really hoping we'll like explore what I believe is her bisexuality, but she doesn't know it yet, but I'm pretty sure it's in there. Maybe okay. you guys can have drinks. I think we, you guys would, would have so much fun getting would, a gorgeous- cup a I, I coffee would, a, a, a gorgeous cup um a gorgeous nussy is that what you're implying yes, just a little nurse um listen i y- it has been wonderful to sit here with our nussies and really convene you have taken me to so many places so many funny places Amazing. so many important places so many you know passionate places and you have really been uh, honestly one of the favorite guests i've ever had on the guilty feminist oh, Deborah. And there's more where that came from. You can get my book. Love that story. It's available. I'm really excited that it's out in the United Kingdom. There's so much. And I just poured my heart into this book. It's a collection of essays that encapsulates the passion that we've been talking about. It's every so many of the subjects that I spent so much of my time as a podcast host and as a researcher and as a person researching and cultivating. So these stories are really important to me. And I hope that people get a chance to read them or listen to them because I did the audiobook too. And it's very fun. Great. So uh, love that story. JVN. Get out and buy that now. I know what you're buying every single person in your life for Christmas. Uh, There is no more powerful and positive voice uh, working today than that of Jonathan Van Ness. Wherever they go, they bring uh, love, understanding, compassion, passion, and a genuinely new way of looking at the world that will move you. Uh, If you do not read this book, I'm not speaking to you. Um, If you don't give this book to at least one person for Christmas or Hanukkah or Eid or whatever you're celebrating or someone's birthday, then we are not friends anymore. Uh, So I need you to go and do that right now if you can afford it. And if you can't afford it, share it online. Tell someone else to buy it for you um, or just send out a little tweet and ask somebody else, hey, can you read me a passage online? Um, If you would like me to read anything online from your book on Instagram, I would love to do that. Send me a little passage and I'll read it on my Instagram and tell everyone they have to buy it right now. JVN, you are the actual best. Thank you for having me. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, and my very special guest, Jonathan Vaness, JVN themselves. The Guilty Feminist theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge and produced by Nick Sheldon. The producer for the Spontaneity Shop was Tom Zielinski. Thanks to Chad, AJ, Alana, Bjorn and Gina, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Are you a white I don't want to impose whiteness on you, by the way. Oh, no, I am. Um, okay, just check in. Mm-hmm. You might just turn yeah. around and say, no, I'm one-eighth something. Or whatever, yeah. So oh, I'll cut. I wish, but no, <laughs> alas. Um, but as we as white people like need to be not just going, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. You know, when The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively 